of Education for the Jubilee Centre for Character and Virtues. Most of my research has been in the field of character and digital virtue in the last few years. Um, and uh, it's been very key, clear to me that uh, it's very important that we start to look at this uh, or take an understanding of what, how can we educate children as digital citizens uh, by adopting a much more primary focus on character uh, and character education and wisdom. Teachers, educationists, parents, policy makers um, are, are really faced with big questions today. Um, so, uh, for example, how can I help my children minimise the risk and maximise the opportunities of being online today? How much time is too much screen, screen time? Is it actually screen time I should be worried about or the content of what our children or pupils are actually accessing online? And, and really, there seems to be these questions screaming out. Is our digital technologies the, a force for good or are they indeed the root of all evil? These sorts of questions uh, seem to permeate a lot of our discussions and we, we as educationists are trying to come up with solutions and ideas to help our children flourish uh, really in uh, today's uh, digital world. Uh, and many of us turn to standard approaches like rules based approaches and consequence based approaches to put in rules to try and uh, stop our uh, children or limit their access to the technology and the content of it. And clearly that's necessary. We also try and educate about the consequences consequences of uh, uh, what children may happen online, about their digital legacies, etc. Clearly that is very necessary as well. But what has seemed to be underexplored now, and this is why the Jubilee Centre are putting so much focus on this, is what might a, a character-based approach to digital citizenship education look like? Um, how might we educate uh, children to become more digitally wise, um, to help them make the right decision at the right time, uh, and important given the digital domain when no one is watching because so many of our children are operating with smartphones and digital technologies when people aren't actually watching them um, today. So this will be the real focus and as I say we're going to be giving you real insights into uh, kind, of, uh, kind of practice what's going on in the classrooms and what charities are doing as well as our own research in, in this field. So um, what I hopefully we were able to do today is give you an initial insight into what a character based approach to digital citizenship education will be like. Certainly, this is a complex area and we will not be able to, I'm telling you now, answer all of your questions about how you might be able to do this. But hopefully we'll make you think uh, in different sorts of ways and also get some inspiration uh, from practice uh, through through this. I often say that teaching digital citizenship today is like trying to uh, uh, kind of shoot in the, in the dark while trying to hit a moving target, given that technology has changed so quickly and the advice out there is sometimes quite confusing. So hopefully we can bring some light to that. As you'll see in the uh, chat, we really encourage your questions, reflections, comments as we go through this webinar. Um, I will be making sure that we leave a good 20 minutes at the end, if not a bit more time for, you, uh, for me to pose your questions to our panel. So please do make sure that you use that chat feature and pose questions and we'll pick those up as we go through. I'm going to be introducing our panel members, uh, Mr. Peachy, Lee Peachy, um, uh, Sanjeet Bulla and uh, Sophie Murphy uh, before each of their presentations. But before I do that, I'd like to uh, turn to my colleague uh, uh, Gianfranco Polizzi, who's working with me at the Jubilee Centre on developing and designing a new intervention that we will be testing next year in schools um, to see whether we can hope to cultivate some of the components of cyber wisdom. Uh, and I'm going to turn to Franco to just give a brief overview of that research that we're currently undertaking in the centre. Okay, so yeah. Hi, everyone. So it's such a pleasure to be here today and to be talking about such an important issue uh, with, with practitioners and educators and, 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 and people that are interested in, in digital citizenship education. So what do we mean by digital citizenship in the first place? That is generally understood as kind of education that aims at kind of um, equipping children with the ability to um, kind of use digital technologies responsibly and with a view to participating actively in society. So what I would like to do now is to basically uh, introduce you to the concept of uh, cyber wisdom. And in our work, uh, as Tom was saying, we argue indeed that a cyber wisdom approach to digital citizenship education is essential and it, it needs to be promoted more, more robustly. So importantly, as Tom was saying, we need to ensure that children and young people do not just follow rules, 
or think reflectively about the consequences of their online actions, but they're encouraged to develop and to deploy different virtues online, such as compassion and honesty, both responsibly and autonomously. Cyber wisdom functions as an intellectual virtue, but is, but is also an overarching virtue that enables users to deploy the right virtues depending on context. In addition, it is particularly important um, when we're presented with moral dilemmas that result from the clash of two or more virtues. This may include, for example, deciding whether or not to be loyal to a friend, even though they may have done something bad online, or to report them in the name of honesty. As such, cyber wisdom, as Tom was saying, can be broadly defined um, as the ability to, the right, to do the right thing at the right time when using the internet. But what does it really involve and, and how can it be cultivated in, in the classroom? So in our work, um, we argue that cyber wisdom should be understood as including four components. Cyber wisdom literacy, cyber wisdom reasoning, cyber wisdom self-reflection and cyber wisdom motivation. So what I will do now is to briefly, um, to briefly discuss uh, each of these and, and to focus on, on how each component can be taught in practice in the classroom. So uh, when it comes to so cyber wisdom literacy, uh, this requires um, an understanding of the nature and the role of different virtues such as compassion, honesty, loyalty, civility, justice, resilience, both in general and in terms of how these virtues apply specifically to different online contexts and in ways that can enable users to maximize online opportunities while minimizing online risks. Having uh, cyber wisdom literacy includes, for example, appreciating the importance of using social media to access information, to access information and interact with others uh, while understanding the value of producing and disseminating information online in line with principles of honesty as well as the value of showing compassion to those who receive negative comments uh, on social media. In short, uh, cyber wisdom literacy is about understanding how multiple virtues can be acted upon in ways that preserve a balance between taking advantage of online opportunities while avoiding or coping with online risks. So in practice, teaching cyber wisdom literacy could rely, for example, on the use of narratives and stories so as to encourage students to develop an understanding of the role of different virtues online. The benefits of this method for teaching moral character um, are, are well documented in the literature. This means that teachers could use, for example, real stories or virtuous practice based on online opportunities. Think, for example, of online communities working together in the name of solidarity. But at the same time, they could also use stories of online abuse or of, or, or, or of other online risks, such as plagiarism, for example, in order to teach students at different key stages about the importance of possessing different virtues online. So cyber wisdom reasoning is the second component of cyber wisdom, and this component refers to the ability to choose the right course of action online, especially, as I was saying earlier, when we're confronted with moral dilemmas. This might include, for example, deciding whether to prioritize compassion or honesty when our opinions on social media can hurt the feelings of others, or whether or not to use social media in the first place to show compassion to others as opposed to engaging in face-to-face -face interactions. Importantly, this component is grounded in the recognition that moral dilemmas online are often exacerbated both by the technical features of the internet, think for example of what it affords in terms of anonymity, and by the extent to which internet corporations operate in ways that are largely unsupervised and underregulated. This is why it, it, you know, it is, it, this is why what is specific about this component is that users need to factor in whether and if so how experiencing moral dilemmas online may involve scenarios and possible actions and reactions that are specific to using the internet. This may include accessing information free of charge versus observing copyright laws, as well as the possibility of, you know, which can hinder, you know, um, the, the ways in which, you know, users with limited financial resources, um, you know, access information, as well as the possibility of reporting online abuse directly to social media platforms. In terms of teaching cyber wisdom reasoning online, um, uh, so we know from oral research that asking students to explore and discuss ethical dilemmas 
science contributes to their ability to, 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 to use moral reasoning in order to evaluate multiple scenarios and choose the best course of action in a given situation. This means that a useful way to teach savvy wisdom reasoning could be to have classroom discussions aimed at encouraging students to evaluate online dilemmas, both hypothetically and in relation to their own online experiences. Cyber wisdom self-reflection. So cyber wisdom self-reflection, this component consists of uh, the ability to navigate A, our own perspectives and those of others, and B, our own emotions and those of others. Um, these two aspects are particularly important when it comes to using the internet. And this is because the internet, again, because of its technical features, but also because of how internet corporations operate, amplify, um, you know, amplifies online risks from the polarization of public debate to forms of online abuse. Such risks reflect different perspectives, including those of victims and of perpetrators, and are fueled by different emotions. This may include, for example, sentiments of hatred and division towards others and towards different communities. Sentiments that fuel, in turn, not just the extent to which public debate online is polarized, but also risks such as cyberbullying and hate speech motivated by sexism, racism, um, or xenophobia. It follows that in order to exercise cyber wisdom self-reflection, uh, users need to be able to reflect on their own biases and to regulate their own emotions when dealing with moral dilemmas online. At the same time, they need to be able to navigate the emotions of others within online settings, for example, on social media platforms, in which um, their own biases might clash with the perspectives of others. In terms of teaching cyber wisdom self-reflection, this could be done by asking students to keep journals and diaries, which is a method that is particularly valuable for encouraging students to develop character through self-reflection uh, on their own practices and experiences. More specifically, students could be asked to write about um, and to reflect on, their own moral, uh, on the moral implications of their own online experiences on the extent to which these are driven by different emotions and on whether and if so how they manage to regulate their emotions in ways that are mindful of their own biases and of the perspectives and emotions of other users. Finally, said the wisdom motivation. So this component, which has to do with the development of users moral identity, refers to a desire to act uh, on different virtues online, in line with the ideals of the digital world that are underpinned by principles of the common good. In practice, possessing cyber wisdom motivation means that users need to be able to construct and to mobilize expectations of how themselves and other users should deploy different virtues when using digital technologies and when interacting online with one another. Users' moral aspirations could include, for example, expecting users to interact online in honest and compassionate ways, as well as expecting online communities to engage in public debate in ways that are mindful of their, of their different concerns, but also of a certain degree of civility. Finally, this might also include expecting internet corporations to make more efforts to tackle online risks um, in ways that are underpinned by virtuous principles of transparency and accountability. So with this in mind, cyber wisdom motivation could be taught in the classroom through the use of stories and discussions about exemplars and role models aimed at encouraging students to develop and deploy through admiration and emulation moral aspirations that relate to the internet and that apply to different online contexts. The benefits of using this teaching method for promoting character and moral education are indeed well established. This means that teachers could draw, for example, on examples of online activism who have been committed to campaigning, for instance, against cyberbullying, including famous activists such as Lizzie Velasquez. Velasquez. So this is all for me. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Franco, for that overview. If you're, anyone's interested in finding out more about that research project, please do visit the Jubilee Centre webpage, Projects. Um, we can post that link in the chat room so you can see uh, background to that uh, project. And we are also looking for schools, uh, secondary schools, to help us trial that intervention next year. Um, some of the panel are actually helping out with that. If anyone else, anyone's at a secondary school would be interested in helping us uh, trial that intervention uh, next academic year, please do let us know. I'm now delighted to turn to our first uh, uh, panellist, uh, external panellist from the Jubilee Centre, um, Sophie Murfin. Sophie Murfin is the CEO and the Executive uh, Principal at the Wise Owl Trust, uh, which is comprised of three schools in Manchester, and I visit them, visited the schools and they do a fantastic job 
Uh, Sophie has actually written a programme of character education which is now used in over 700 schools nationwide and internationally as well and recently she's turned her intention um, to uh, creating a series of workshops that particularly look at this issue of uh, char character in the digital age right now. So Sophie's a fantastic uh, uh, speaker to tell us a bit more about what she's doing in her primary school around this. So over to you Sophie. Thank you Tom. Share my screen. So good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to be here um, today to share with you the work that we've been doing over here at Wise Owl Trust. And we're really excited that we are uh, showcasing our schools of schools of character after being awarded the Kite Mark Plus in 2019. Just to give you a really quick snippet about us, um, because I am aware that some people may already use our programmes within your schools, or indeed um, you may have been on a webinar um, prior with the Character Association, whereby I've spoken about our trust. Um, so really quickly, our trust focuses, it is unwavering, and it's wholeheartedly committed to preparing our children for the life beyond school gates taking the local context and the issues that our children face very much as the drivers behind our curriculum, our ethos and our vision. All three of our schools are in really highly deprived areas of East Manchester, but through our continued focus on the, the building of character traits and in turn fostering the right attitudes towards learning, we've seen a real shift in aspiration. And in 2019, we were in the top 3% nationally for progress measures at Key Stage 2. I keep bringing that one back out because I'm not sure wh where we're going to be post-COVID. Um, so I'm going to use it as much as I possibly can. Um, and my slides have stopped. There we go. Um, so our experience as a leadership team is working in failing schools and helping them to realise their potential. With all three of our schools having been on a really long journey and now to be awarded Ofsted judgments are good, but we attribute a huge part of the, our success stories to the focus continuously on character education, adapting to the, to the needs of our pupils and developing a character program over five years ago, which now runs throughout all school life. And as you can see from the aims and our rationale on the slide, which it shouldn't say intent or rationale, it should say rationale or intention. But anyway, our intention was to give our children opportunities that they may otherwise not have had. And this also means good role models and the opportunity to begin to understand themselves, their emotions and their ability to self-regulate. That's a massive part of what we do within our trust. And part of this is for them to really understand and own their own character, their own strengths and their own areas for development, which has led to character development not only being caught within our schools, but also sought. And this in turn has, stead, uh, has stood our children in really good stead when they're faced with making those decisions, independent decisions online. So we teach our children through our respect curriculum, and this is the backbone of absolutely everything that we do, running through all of our policies, including the behaviour policy, whereby children are not rewarded for good behaviour, but rather for showing specific behaviour traits, which are explicitly pointed out to showcase good practice support for those that may be struggling, and it has also developed a common language across all aspects of the school focused on character. It's also building that intrinsic reward to make the right decisions, which has been a really firm grounding for our children when making their online choices and offered the anonymity and seemingly boundary-free world of the internet. And it's these freedoms that have made our focus on character, along with the pupils wanting to make the right choice, that has helped us to prepare our children to deal with the fast paced developments of technology of today, and ultimately preparing them for a future world that still knows us all. In addition to our character curriculum, we also have Wise Our Wellbeing strategy, which sits hand in hand with our respect curriculum and supports our children to have a happy mind, healthy body and hearty soul. And it's the development of these two strategies that's been the basis upon which we've built our new cyber character programme. So pre-pandemic, we'd seen the need to develop a character programme, um, taking some of the points from our existing programmes, such as teaching character through real life scenarios and giving our children the experience of problem solving and critical thinking when faced with dilemma. And we already knew we had a real focus on supporting our children to navigate the, the World Wide Web, 
but recognizing that technology now plays such a huge part in our children's lives, it's important that we tool them with the necessary or give them the necessary tools to independently navigate the world of cyber successfully. This includes teaching them what to do when things go wrong, when no one's looking, but also to take adva full advantage of what the World Wide Web can offer. So prior to writing our programme, we did a poll across our trust to find out really the real extent of the use of devices. And we knew that the percentage percentages were going to be high, but we didn't quite realise how high. Although we do recognise that these big figures are skewed, one because of the context of our schools, but also that COVID has exacerbated the reliance on technology and all of that data is included within the data that you see on screen today. But regardless of these potential reasons, what became apparent to the staff team across the trust was the necessity to enhance our cyber teaching further. We know that despite social media companies uh, placing age limits on their platforms, children are still accessing them and using them. So we've embraced this within our trust and are act actively using some of the platforms in school to show how we can use them safely and how to become responsible di digital citizens, developing the, the cyber character of not only our children, but also our staff and our parents, all the while reminding our children that there are relevant age re restrictions. Obviously, as, as most will have experienced, after lockdown and on the return of our children coming back to school, we did see a huge spike in the number of online issues that were coming into the school playground and also the classroom. And at times, what was quite shocking to us was the behaviour shown online was in stark contrast to the behaviours that we would see from that person physically face to face within the school. So we set about creating our vision. And we involved all of our stakeholders in this. This gave us a real flavour of the concerns and the opportunities perceived by both adults and children, which actually at times were in stark contrast to one another. We found that the children outwit the adults in terms of their knowledge, and they knew about new apps and features that adults really didn't know. The children also showed a real want to display digital wisdom and to understand how to be model citizens online as well as offline. And I think as much as much of that has come from the wide work that we've done over many years to build up the, the character sort within our schools. But from speaking to parents, we also know that they feel that they need help and assistance in instilling the correct behaviour traits into their children to make the right choices when online not through lack of wanting uh, to um, by the parents themselves, but rather because their knowledge was outwitted by the, their own children and their own ability to be able to serve the web. And obviously with the access um, to apps being far easier for younger children to access. Our staff were also really behind this move. Um, a lot of staff have, have explained that since um, launching the programme, it's actually also helped them to understand not only the dangers, the risks, the opportunities, but how to reflect on their own online behaviours. We also did a full reading and research piece looking at everything that was out there to see what we could use and adapt and um, obviously use the best practice. So we developed Stop, Think, Action, Reflect, Respect. Respect is obviously um, feeding into our respect character um, program that's used right the way across the trust and the children from the age of three know all about the respect curriculum. In fact, they could tell you they could come and do this webinar for me. Um, but we wanted something that the children could remember and it gives them something to just take time out, a moment to just think before responding. And this was most recently played back to us in a real life scenario whereby we had a potential case of a child being groomed and that child actually used this to just take a moment to stop, think, think about what the actions were going to be and, and reflect. By explicitly teaching character and offering the children the safety of a, um, of a classroom in which to explore their ability to self-regulate, we aim to provide the necessary insights for children to activate their own mechanism of self-control, which obviously we know is ever so important online. We know that with the size, strength and complexity of the grown World Wide Web, we must teach these overarching principles that can be adapted when faced within any situation. 
So our intent, intention has been to teach our pupils the combination of understanding the dangers while supporting them to develop the character virtues to enable the self sanctions uh, needed to serve the web safely and um, with moral intention. So we developed um, a series of workshops and each workshop could be a standalone lesson or extended into a project or a block of lessons with the intention to share with other schools so other schools can use them exactly however they want to be used. And we focus on our character traits from our respect curriculum, resilience, empathy, self-awareness, positivity, excellence, communication and teamwork. And a big, big um, amount of time is given at the end of each lesson to focus on um, the children's ability to be able to self-reflect and make judgments about their own personal strengths and growth points, recognising that there are times when it's only ourselves that can self-regulate our own actions. And we've also put in some um, workshop ground rules there as well. And we've linked everything back to the statutory guidance, uh, the RSE statutory guidance. This slide just shows a really quick overview of some of the workshops that we focused on, um, looking at honesty and online anonymity. anonymity. <laughs> I do apologise, I've got tonsillitis, so that's why I keep, I keep pausing. Um, workshop two focuses on self-control and self-regulation, looking at the rules and the laws and understanding that there are rules and laws, but actually on the World Wide Web, sometimes they're not challenged and we actually have to use our own good intention to stick within the boundaries. Um, workshop three focuses on compassion, looking at, that should say trolling, not tolling, um, hate crime and bullying. Um, willpower in workshop four, resilience, looking at um, a massive big thing for us within the primary sector has been looking at that resilience and that willpower um, and addiction to technology and how we can help and support our children not to use technology at all times and workshop six and i know we're only primary schools but looking at that self-control and self-regulation online gambling our children have been um, witness to quite a lot of things during lockdown within the within the home and it also does feature within the rsc statutory guidance and here's just a quick little overview of the kind of things that we've put within our packs. Um, so this is one workshop, Willpower and Chasing the Likes. We give an overview to the teachers about um, what the key information is from all the research that we've done. And we've, uh, we've done a specific character challenge. So the specific character challenge really is drawing out the character traits that are required to, um, to, to, to deal with these issues online, but also putting back into a classroom challenge whereby the children are actually put into a challenge and they're faced with those dilemmas so that they can face those with the um, safety of the of the classroom teachers to be able to help and there's a, a, an example of a reflection journal that will be built up over time so every single workshop has a reflection journal um, for the children to be able to work through and self-reflect as Franco was discussing before. And we are in our infancy, this is um, organic and it's growing as we move forward. The impact from the pupils and teachers has been great. We've had some amazing feedback from the teachers. They really enjoyed teaching it. They feel like it really fits in with um, the character aspirations of our trust. But mainly what it has done is it's made adults and staff really self-reflect on their own behaviours online and putting themselves as a real role model for the pupils. Um, I know that Twitter and other social media platforms can often be a place to vent and I think that's a real big thing that's come out from our staff and our children likewise have asked for more sessions, more physical sessions that they can get involved in. Thanks. So that's a really quick snip snippet overview of what our trust has been focusing on and hoping to develop further as we move further throughout the year, throughout the year and post pandemic. Thank you very much indeed, Sophie. That is uh, great and uh, really great to get an insight into your practice. As I think you said early on, uh, a lot of these issues used to be the uh, concern of secondary schools, but increasingly their primary school concerns now, given so many uh, different uh, um, uh, students, as you say, are having these um, uh, uh, smartphones in the classroom as well. Um, and people may want to pose you questions during the chat. I'm going to turn quickly to Mr. Peachy because uh, we're slightly running over time um, and I want to make sure that we 
definitely leave time for questions at the end. Um, Mr. Peachy is, uh, Lee Peachy is the deputy head teacher at St. Mary's Catholic High School, uh, which is a comprehensive 11 to 18 uh, school and sixth form college. Uh, Lee does so many different things, including leading on all facets of personal development, including character education, PSHD, health, well-being, mental health, etc. And also his passion for both the field, the, the, the uh, topic of uh, personal development has led him to actually set up a, uh, a membership uh, a community with over 3,500 people and I'm sure I'd like more people to join that. So over to you, uh, Lee. Thank you very much, Tom. So good afternoon, everybody. As Tom mentioned, I'm Lee Peachy and I feel really privileged to be able to be here today to speak to everybody. I am a deputy head and I do uh, lead on all aspects of personal development. Now, from the very start, I did want to make it clear that I don't sit before you this afternoon with all the answers. And indeed, I don't pose a magic wand that will guarantee you to grow flourishing individuals who act with good character and make virtuous decisions, both physically in person, but also online as they navigate this ever-changing landscape. However, what I will share with you this evening are some very practical examples of how we've implemented character and digital citizenship across our school within the last 12 months, which have appeared to be having a positive impact. So... As I've just mentioned, the idea of leading personal development, it actually encompasses all the separate components that you see on the left-hand side of the screen, which makes up our overall composition of offer to pupils. And one really important part of that composition that I'm blessed to lead is character education. And I think it's useful for colleagues to recognize, which is exemplified by the graphic on the screen, that our approach to character education and digital citizenship is multifaceted. And I would like to draw your attention to our tagline, which is preparing pupils for the tests of life and not just for a life of tests. And this is something that we are really passionate about and the development of the whole child in both mind, body and spirit. And we drive this with real energy. It really is the heartbeat of our school and we are living and breathing this each day and so are the pupils. And I'm gonna speak a little bit more about that later on in my reflection. So if we think carefully about the children that grace our classrooms and step through our school day each, uh, each day, it's obvious that through observing their behavior, through conversations with them, their parents, their teachers, that a large amount of their time is spent online and on social media on their phones, on their devices, communicating and interacting across a multitude of platforms. Now their online interaction and activity has been become an integral part of their daily operation and routines. And this has almost been exemplified exponentially through the pandemic as we've all been forced online due to school closure. Now, what's really important and has been really obvious from my work over the last 12 months is we cannot simply assume that because children have been born into this digital era, that they will automatically know how to navigate the landscape, act virtuously and miraculously behave in a respectful and an appropriate manner online without us explicitly teaching them how to do so and modeling this out. And it's a complete false proxy to assume that because pupils use technology a lot, that they possess the necessary skills, knowledge and understanding of how to use it correctly and sensibly. And we cannot assume that they will acquire the skills, knowledge and understanding by osmosis. We need to think carefully about how we structure our support and our guidance for children with this and how it's sequenced and built throughout the school. And it's certainly not just a job solely for the computing department. It takes much more of a joined up approach than that. And what's really apparent and what Sophie mentioned before is there is a real disconnect between how some pupils act in person to how they present and act online. And as teachers, we need to try and address this and break this down and educate pupils about their behavior online and their action has equal status and consequences to how they behave and act in real person. And furthermore, we need to explain how their online activity does leave a traceable uh, legacy which can be impacting on their future life. And we've seen this recently where the England cricketer was sacked due to racist and homophobic tweets, which were posted over a decade ago. And this really does exemplify the need for education and guidance in this area for our young people. And on that thought of education, schools are now being made much more accountable to teach pupils about online behaviour through the new statutory RSE guidance, which Sophie mentioned before, and also updates to keeping children safe in education. 
This puts a huge emphasis on contextualized safeguarding. So anything extra familial and that the child is exposed to outside of the family unit. And I think it's important to press at this point that we must educate pupils of the risks that are involved with online activity to allow them to remain safe and protected. And it is absolutely right that we cover abuse, trolling, grooming, extremism, fraud, identity theft, bullying, the list goes on. But also share the multitude of opportunities that are available to them at their disposable. Now, the very reason why I'm sat in front of you today is due to my interaction on Twitter and able to reach out to people such as Tom, Solfair, Sajit and Franco and engage in that professional dialogue. And these opportunities are available to pupils as well. So when educating pupils about opportunities, we may explore things such as networking, employment, personal branding, marketing and growth, research, learning and education, friendships and relationships and communication and connection. So moving on to the very practical elements I mentioned at the very start of my section this evening, I truly believe that to reach the utopia where pupils are demonstrating good character and making virtuous decisions online, we must actually get them to act like this in person first. So making virtuous choices has to be habitual. It has to be automatic, programmed and ingrained. Then we have much more of a fighting chance with getting pupils to act like this way online when no one else is around. So one of the ways we've tried to achieve this was to implement a set of character virtues that we built with our school community. We spoke to pupils, parents, staff, local community representatives, partner primary heads, local businesses, bus drivers, universities, basically anybody who would have a conversation with us. And we asked them what sort of virtues they would thought if we taught our young people would actually make our community a better place. And we had 1,800 people respond in the consultation. And then we use this intelligence to build the virtues that you can see on screen. So from the very start, we had collective ownership of our school virtues as they were collaboratively built. And this really did help with the implementation across school. So our virtues permeate everything that we do. They're not just laminated and stuck on the wall. The virtues are a common vernacular and language across our school community. And we live and breathe this every single day. We explore these virtues through our discrete personal development lessons from year seven to 13. And we have dedicated form time once per week to look at moral dilemmas where pupils discuss and apply the virtues to real life scenarios that they face in our local community. We have character cards for staff on their lanyards and every conversation is drawn back to developing a pupil's character and explaining how to make more virtuous, take more virtuous actions. The virtues have become an achievement strand in our newly implemented behaviour policy and they are part of our staff recruitment process and staff are actually firstly employed a teacher of character before their specialised subject. And each one of the virtues then becomes a theme of the week and we communicate this heavily through assemblies, social media, parental emails and as being a Catholic school each one of our virtues is then underpinned by scripture. And we also relentlessly remind pupils about what character is. So their daily actions, which are guided by the character conversations that staff have with pupils, plus the knowledge they acquire through our personal development curriculum itself, then lays the foundations for their character. And over time, their daily actions become their habits and their automatic behavior defaults. And then their habits over a longer period of time eventually become their character and who they become as a person. And we have that constant focus of this running throughout the school. Another decision we've taken is to make sure that the virtues are non-negotiable across all schemes of work within the school and across all subject domains. And we've implemented a standard slide at the start of all lessons where colleagues will explore our character virtues through the lens of their own subject specialism. So to summarize the development of a pupil's character through our systems and structures we've implemented for pupils and also our staff is simply unavoidable. And I think this is absolutely crucial as pupils are then familiar with having constant conversations about their character across all aspects of their education, on the corridors, in their lessons, in the lunch queue, and through every interaction that we have with them. And this means that when we come to educate pupils about how to be virtuous online in the digital realm, they already have a solid grounding and an understanding. So looking at the curriculum itself. Um, 
I also think looking at the delivery of digital citizenship, you need to think carefully about the sequencing and have evidence-informed practice in mind. So explicitly sharing where the learning has come from and a preview of where it's going next. And if we're really thinking about altering long-term memory and the acquisition of this important knowledge into pupil schema and long-term memory again, so that they're able to draw this back and apply it in situations that they face online, then we need to think about giving it the curriculum time it really does deserve to make it stick. And perhaps we need to question the models of drop-down days or episodic assemblies, which may be perceived to be less impactful. And what we've also found really important is to allow pupils to have those open and honest conversations and structured talk about real life scenarios that they face online and explore as a class which virtues could be applied. So here we see an example of harassment via WhatsApp messages, and this then would be opened up to the class using the structured talk prompts at the bottom of the screen. And I think sharing videos as well has been really important. That's helped our delivery as well. But then the facilitating that discussion, that the questioning as well is absolutely crucial after the videos have been shared and allowing that period of time, as Sophie mentioned before, for that personal reflection. And finally, we have introduced moral dilemmas, which are used within tutor time each week, where once again, we present real life situations to pupils and ask them how would they respond and explain how to take a more virtuous approach. And what has been really useful here is that whatever issues that we're seeing becoming more prevalent throughout the school year and also in our local community, we can respond to through our moral dilemmas to help break these down. This then becomes absolutely responsive to the needs of the children that we serve. And as you can see through student voice, it would appear that we could make a fair assumption that it's having a significant impact um, on the children that we, uh, we serve at St. Mary's. So in terms of the character virtues, we can see that 85.7% said that they're making them uh, make better decisions, both online and offline. And we've also got some strong parent voice as well that triangulates with this. And this then gives us confidence as we move forward for planning for September 2021. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Thank you very much indeed, Lee. And I know you were uh, speeding through that and there's so much content. And what um, I've always said is character education has got to be like a stick of rock for a school. Every time, any way you cut through it, you will see it happening. And it's absolutely clear that is going on in your school, which is great. Um, I'm going to turn um, to uh, Sanjeet, Dr. Sanjeet uh, Bulanair as our last speaker. And Sanjeet, I wonder if you can keep your comments to kind of five or so minutes just so that we do have some time. I'm sorry to cut you a bit shorter in that, but I want to leave some time for questions at the end. Uh, Sanjeet is uh, uh, the fan founder of the very appropriately named for today Wise Kids, which is a non-profit company which empowers young people, families, communities and professionals to develop their digital literacy and expertise. And she's got a great deal of expertise uh, in this field of uh, digital citizenship. And I'm going to uh, hand over to Sanjeet now. Thank you very much, Tom, and for the opportunity to share some of our insights. So uh, my work is really around uh, working with families, working with young people and educators. So what I wanted to do probably was speak more to the digital elements of our theme today. Um, and a copy of the slides are going to be made available as well. So I guess in a way, when talking about you know, digital citizenship or character in the digital world, we're really talking about the whole human being. And I start with the question, what does a child understand about the internet? Because what they understand will also uh, impact on their decisions and how they think and relate to the world. Um, and if you think about it, so many children go on Google, they, you know, use apps, but what is the fundamental ground of understanding? And that's often my starting point in a workshop if I'm running that in schools, it's what do you think the internet actually is? And, you know, how public is it? Um, who can see what you share? Um, and one of the big, big things I found really um, powerful is using analogies, making the internet relatable. So the need for concepts here, because underlying all our interactions is this very real structure that goes across the world that connects people, information services, and we are so used to seeing the applications that run on the internet. So a child will recognize WhatsApp or Instagram or, you know, um, Netflix or Tumblr or, you know, apps that they might use. But fundamentally, when I want them to sort of begin to think about audience and privacy, one of the analogies I use is the internet is just like a global city. 
And the reason I use this analogy is I want the, the actions to be relatable. I want them to think about who they see in the city. And often when I talk to young people, particularly in primary school, um, you know, one of the questions I ask is, would mum or dad take you to London or Cardiff and leave you on your own? And they say, you know, come on, miss, of course not, because it might be dangerous, it might be big, there may be bad people, even though a city is full of exciting things and opportunities as well. And children recognize how vast it is. So I think when we educate around digital, one of the things is to understand what children understand, because you can't meet them in their experience unless we sort of have that common ground. And so the analogy of that city is one of the key things we use in our work with young people. And understanding that the internet is more than social media. It has communities, information, businesses. It has, you know, content. And getting young people to also think about who owns this, where does data flow, what is their place in this global village, um, you know, connected through technology. And then the questions become more nuanced, like what are the best places in the city? You know, how can I manage my privacy in the city? Can I recognize risk? And that's one of the big things I want to talk about, because I think today, in all the work that I've been doing it over many, many years, and this work is about 20 years, uh, you know, in the sort of um, in action, um, it's, it's helping children na navigate risk. And I want to share a little story really of three 11 year olds who were on Instagram on a sleepover. And this is a true story. Um, I was working with the Child Protection Agency who was sharing this story with me. And the three 11 year olds were having a lovely time. They were sharing some photos uploaded to the internet. And one of them tagged her friends in it. And the other three girls, um, the other two girls, and this girl who, who had this friend. So this, the, the one girl, let me start again. The one girl had someone on her contact list who should not have been there. And she proceeded, um, you know, when she tagged her friends, this individual started texting all three of them, messaging them, I think after the sleepover and basically directly threatening them and asking them for a nude uh, image, or he would come to their homes and harm them. Now, three 11 year olds, and, you know, quite different responses. Uh, we had quite different responses. So the one girl blocked him. The one girl was so frightened by the idea that, um, you know, this person was going to come and harm her mum or dad, that she actually sent a nude. And then in the third case, this young person actually turned on him, called him a bunch of names and said, how dare he? And then proceeded to block him and report him, which is how the case came out. So my question is, how do we prepare children for interactions that they may not be ready for? Um, what do they understand about this digital world? And it also speaks to the, the environment in the home. You know, would mum and dad scold them? What is going to stop them actually accessing help? So we're speaking about supportive environments in the home, the need for that the need for non-judgment, the need for open communication, because all these things are protective. And if we go to uh, Professor Sonia Livingston's new framework for risk, which are the four C's here, content, contact, contract, and conduct, I just want you to look very quickly at the three strands of risks there, aggressive sexual values risk. Now you'll notice something. Most of this uh, are about behavior. A lot of this is about behavior and the human being. So when we prepare children and young people for the world, it's not enough that we just work on character and education because that's absolutely key. And I'm you know, delighted by Tom's work in this, in this field and it's been so inspiring listening to the two teachers as well. But I think there's also the stuff they're going to encounter, the stuff that we want them to be able to recognize as being inappropriate or that is harassing. And there's also this whole notion of the digital world that feeds us our information and that shapes our thinking and making sure that they have the information, media literacy skills to understand agendas, bias is also absolutely key. And it's all these things together that will help people thrive, young people thrive online. So really the model of digital citizenship that I use and have been using for work um, over the last 10 years really is one that says to get a culture of digital citizenship, you need to be digitally skilled and literate. And here I'm not talking about safety only, but everything, laws online, where to report things, all that is good online, you know, and I think um, 
Lee spoke to that, and I think that's so important, a balanced approach, not using fear. And then on the right-hand side, we're really talking about values and character, but well-being, because all of us face vulnerability in our lives sometimes. And so we are not static human beings. So, you know, it is in that dynamic interchange with the world that we decide to take an action. So knowing what drives behavior is really important when we stop to consider interventions. Um, and so my final two slides to try and cut this down yes, is risk you. is not the same as harm. Sorry, Tom, going like a train here. <laughs> And for well-being, we need children to recognize risk in a way that is not scary, you know, making sure that we give them and help them develop a sense of agency and meet them in their experience, non-judgment. But a lot of this that I want to say is it's not about the digital per se, but about values and character, but also about consent, healthy relationships. Because if a child of 15 is asked by their boyfriend or girlfriend for a nude, what do they do? It's not about the online. It's not about character necessarily. It might be about needing to be liked and accepted in my relationship with my boyfriend. So some of this stuff we need to unpack further. But I'm you know, very heartened by the lovely work being done and, and listening to uh, all the previous speakers. And, you know, using this balanced approach, which recognizes the UN rights of the child, being inclusive, because I know that some pe young people with learning difficulties, with very difficult family homes may have, um, you know, may be exploited more easily online. So those are some of the things we need to think about. So I'm going to stop there because I think there's a lot more we could talk about, but hopefully we'll get an opportunity. And please feel free to email me if you've got any questions. We deliver lots of programs for educators and for young people. Thank so you thank very you much. very much. Thank you, Sanjeev. And thank you again for rushing through that. And as I say, we will be sharing the slides to uh, from all the presenters to all of you so you can see through them. Uh, and we'll uh, share their contact details as well if you've got any specific questions. We have managed to leave about six minutes, which is nothing like what I was hoping to, but at least to address some of the, some of the questions. And we've had a couple uh, coming in already. If anyone wants to post further questions in the chat, please do. If we don't get to those questions, then I will take it on myself to work with the panellists to answer those questions via email to you as well. So we'll certainly... Uh, address any questions that we can't pick up in the remaining time. Um, the first question I'm just going to approach Sophie and actually Sanjeev was uh, um, touching on that issue about the fact that children live in hybrid worlds right now and behaviour in one place should definitely be uh, uh, appropriate and digital as well. As, so do you try to as, uh, make children and young people see the kind of the digital world as very much the same behaviour expectations as uh, the real world? I suppose that's the journey that we're just embarking upon at the moment in so much as um, within the primary um, sector, the children don't have access to the devices that they would possibly have at secondary. So for example, our children don't bring devices to school. Um, they only have like one ICT lesson each week and things like that. So what it's almost gone unnoticed, I would say, but it's obviously become more prevalent in the in the um, past 18 months, especially seen as though we've given devices to every child. So now what we're trying to do is embrace that, ask the children to bring the devices in and really try to show them that using the devices is part of, of, of real life. We're also trying to be really good role models using some of the online platforms that we know our children are accessing. For example, TikTok is a massive one that our children are using at the moment. Um, so we try to use that, obviously, in the older year groups as a real teaching tool so that the children don't, because at the moment there's a massive disconnect between the devices and the use of them at home, which are for fun and entertainment and gaming, whereas the devices in school are very much a learning opportunity. So I think it's about trying to embrace that and bring it together so that we're not putting the rules in place that they can't bring things into school, etc., um, and trying to showcase how they can use them to good effect. But I suppose that's the journey that we're just embarking upon at the moment. Thank you. That's great, Sophie. I'm going to direct the next question to Lee about parents, because this is a great question from uh, uh, Rebecca Roberts, which comes up all the time about the fact that so much of the responsibility for this area isn't actually schools. And you mentioned that yourself in your own presentation. It starts from the home and it starts from the family as a parent myself. I see that primary my responsibility but uh, uh, Lee how, how do you work with parents in this sort of area? 
Yeah, so absolutely great question. And I suppose when you do look at character, parents are the primary educators. And when you actually look at the character guidance from the Department for Education, it is the first bullet point that they reference in there. So there is absolutely a big body of work to do with supporting parents to sort of instill that behaviour at home. So it is absolutely fantastic, the work that we put in with, within school hours, but then if it's then gone home and completely unpicked, it very much does need that joined up approach. So some of the practical strategies that we've done, um, every half term where we've covered digital citizenship, we provide parents with a curriculum update. Now we've moved away from sort of sending letters home with information on there to try and overcome literacy barriers. So we've created YouTube videos, which have been put together by our student leadership team that explain what has been covered in the curriculum and they will that they will then be text out to parents. We will also offer sort of cluster um, parenting groups that are delivered via Zoom, which um, is, is a big piece of learning that we've taken through the lockdowns that we can now actually access families who may have struggled to get on school site for meetings and do this targeted support. So, yeah, we, we, we've run classes via Zoom to explore kind of issues around sort of the use of digital technology where we've had concerns before. Excellent. Thank you very much. And it is a very uh, difficult question, but I know schools are really rising to the challenge now of how to work in partnership with parents around this. Jubilee Centre itself has uh, published some research uh, and workshops and materials that uh, not on this digital area, although some of the dilemmas that were talked about have digital focus on them, but more about how teachers and parents might work together in, the, in this area. Um, it's more of kind of a, a reflection, I think, from Caroline about um, uh, off the shelf resources. Uh, one thing we try to say is that a lot of these resources are encouraged education certainly that the Jubilee Centre produces and we've got two different uh, programs from secondary uh, for secondary school and character education and other people have got them as well uh, all of these need to be adapted to the local context so uh, you know be, be careful there's no blueprint we often say in this area it's about kind of adapting them to your use but hopefully the two schemes of uh, work that we offer will be helpful but very happy for you to contact me separately about that Caroline and I can put you in touch or uh, like link you to some other areas as well um, and and um, uh, uh, yes, a, a great comment uh, from um, Esther uh, following up on what Sanjeet said about this isn't about digital, this is about character. And actually, um, when I speak to a lot of parents about this area who are terrified about the digital world because they don't know about how the technology works and what's going to happen, you say, but you do know about helping your children become compassionate, honest, have integrity, accept, uh, uh, you know, show social justice, all the rest of it. You do know about these things. It's about that applied to the digital world. And if you start with the character side, then we've all got access to that even if we're not sure what's going on the technology. Uh, Joe's starting to post things there. Uh, we have one minute left, which is just enough time for me to uh, thank all of our panel. Um, you've got more presentation than questions, but please do feel free to drop any of us questions. We'll share uh, all of our contact details with you afterwards and also the slides from this session. Please do stay in touch with the work of the Jubilee Centre uh, and in particular the Cyber Wisdom Project, if that's what you're interested in. As I say, you can find more details about that uh, online. But thank you so much for joining us uh, for today. Uh, thank you to Sanji. To uh, Mr. Peachy, uh, Lee Peachy, Sophie Murphy, and uh, Franco uh, Polizzi for uh, their presentations today. Uh, and I hope uh, you all have a great evening. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>